week, what we're going to be focusing on is global missions. And so the way that we define global missions is going to show us how we're supposed to be doing all of our outreaches, what's important when we prioritize um, our life goals and what we do as a church and what we do with a career and all that. So the way that we understand the Great Commission is really, really important. So I'll just start off with reading Matthew 28, um, just so that you can kind of uh, get an understanding of where I'm coming from. And then I'm going to break this down with a lot of detail this week. This is all the notes for the whole week. It's not the notes for today. So uh, it won't be that much detail, but it'll be a good amount of it. All right. The, this is uh, when Jesus was coming and then he resurrected. After he resurrected, he showed up to his disciples. Many of his disciples didn't even believe that he resurrected. So Thomas, which is my name, um, which I kind of don't like for this, but Thomas uh, is kind of like the doubter. So a lot of the um, apostles didn't even think he was going to get resurrected, like Peter and all that stuff. So when uh, Thomas first met Jesus, how many of you know the story? He said you're not, that you're not Jesus. And then he said, well, touch my wounds. And so he touched his wounds, and then he showed them, oh, you really are the Son of God. And that's the context right before the Great Commission happened. And so all of the apostles, some of them are still doubting, actually. It says in Matthew 28, some of the apostles doubted that that was Jesus, and some of them worshipped him. And so when they worshipped him, uh, either way, whether they doubted or they worshipped, he still declared what they're supposed to do. And so you kind of have to imagine this, right? It's all these emotions going on. You think that he's not real. Uh, Peter's, they had this moment where Peter, where he started fishing again. And you know the story with Peter where he cried and um, he denied Jesus three times. And then Jesus asked him, Did you, um, do you love me? And then he says, uh, yes, you know, I love you. And he says it three times and he cries. It's right after the apostles went fishing and they, uh, Peter was the one to tell them to, hey, let's go fishing again. And they all immediately followed him if you read the verses before this. And so it's all of this doubt mixed with like, is this really Jesus? And then he sits down and then they realize this is really God. And he says something to them right before he leaves. And that's the, what, the reason why that phrase is important is because it's the last thing in their head before he's gone. If you could almost imagine it, it's a little bit like I had, I had a Lola, a grandma, and then I loved her very dearly. I actually got a tattoo on my shoulder. Just for the record, I saved this for my wife. Guess what? I told Claudia that a couple of days ago because I forgot. <laughs> And then um, she said, uh, I said, Claudia, I just remembered. I saved this arm for my wife. So I said, do you want me to get a tattoo for you? <laughs> and then she said, that's so sweet that you, you saved an arm for me. But why don't you not get a tattoo and we'll just call it a day. So I got a tattoo for my grandma here when I was a, I thought I was Catholic for like a day. So anyways, I got a tattoo. But I was very close to her. That's the point of the story there. And so when she died, I remember it very vividly. If, if any of you have ever had close family members that passed away. And so with my grandma, I literally remember um, I wanted to see her so that I could write a love story of how my grandpa and how my grandma met. Because they met in war and all this other stuff. Like, I mean, during wartime and all that stuff. So it's kind of like romantic. It's around the 50s and stuff like that. So I wanted to kind of capture that. But right when I met her, she was in the hospital already. And then she couldn't talk because she was so weak. And I remember I was like, man, if I could just get one word out of you, I wonder what it would be. Because I used to always talk to her and I hang out with her. And she never talked ever since I saw her on her deathbed. Uh, she, was, she was so weak that she couldn't talk. But I was listening so closely to her that I saw the last air leave her mouth. And I still remember it. If you remember Aldrin's testimony, he remembers closing his dad's eyes before he passed away, right? That's a little bit, even though it's kind of the opposite because Jesus is resurrected. But you have to understand, this is like the last thing they hear from him. 
That's how important it is to understand what is it he's saying. And then they send the Holy Spirit, then he says a bunch of other stuff. But let's go ahead and read verse 16. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee. They went to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but they still had their doubts, right? Then Jesus came to them. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So you must go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And you can be sure that I am always with you to the very end. And then he's gone. Right? So if you can imagine this whole setup, I don't know how he leaves. But if you watched, have you, how many of you watched the new Jesus films? Any of you watched those new ones? Yeah, like, okay, The Passion. So they're actually making another one of, uh, of his resurrection, I think, or something. So, um, yeah, I, some of them they showed, like, he, when he left, it was, like, all this light and stuff like that, some of the movies. We really don't know exactly what happened when he left. But if you could imagine the emotional state of what all of these disciples were thinking about, because that's the one that they spent all their life with, and they watched him die and all this stuff. And you could tell that they were still faithful because they still carried on what he was saying. And so inside of this scripture, there's a lot of things we can break down, which we're going to spend the next week doing that. We're going to spend 10 hours, 10 to 15 hours breaking down what does Jesus mean when he said this, this statement here. So before that, I'm going to start out with a video. And um, it's, uh, it's table 71. I want to give you a little bit. I can't find my, mil- my mouse. Here it is. All right, here it is. Okay, I'm going to give you a little context of this. So if, if you don't know yet, um, out of repetition or me saying it, um, we're a call to all YWAM base. So everything we're doing is built on finishing the Great Commission, which I'm going to define this week because it's very detailed, actually. And this is when, uh, before Call to All started, this is called Table 71, and I'll just give you a little context. So the, Gra- the Billy Graham Association gathers all of these leaders of the whole world together. And what they do is they come together so that they can talk about the evangelism of the entire planet. And so he calls over uh, Paul Eshelman, who is the, one of the leaders that work with us and called All in YWAM. And there, um, he, he's asked, can you gather 600 people of the top leaders of the planet so that we can, and you'll have time to talk about what does it mean for us to finish the Great Commission. And so inside of this meeting, it's a majority of the entire army of God in the entire planet. So it's not like a single denomination. It's not like businesses, missions. It's literally a majority of all of the leaders of the entire Christian body. So that's, these are all of the decision makers in that, in that room there. And they start talking about what is it going to take to finish it. And so this talks about this one table, which was called Table 71. And that's where uh, some of my leaders were on and all this other stuff. And they, talk, they start talking about there's been more work in the last 20 years for the Great Commission than there has been in the last 2000 because of the unity of the entire body of God. And so that's where we stand is the next generation getting our head wrapped around this. Before, we used to think about the Great Commission like, I'm going to evangelize my neighbor. So I'm doing missions if I'm evangelizing my neighbor. And then you could kind of, then you know, some people start thinking about it going like, but we're like a lot bigger than that. We're a lot bigger than just our neighborhood. And then they start looking at the whole nation and going like, well, let's make sure that every single nation has a missionary or a church or something. And so you would have something as big as China, which is almost like 1.8 billion people. And then you would have something as big as or as small as uh, Mongolia as 4 million people. So if you had one church in Mongolia and one church in China and one church in America, then you're done. But obviously you're from countries that aren't like that, right? Vietnam and Myanmar and things like that, or Malaysia, Myanmar. I have a lot of friends in Myanmar right now. So, um, yeah, but that's because they didn't, they weren't understanding what was the Great Commission really about. And so then they started defining that better. 
And then we started learning from the Bible when God said, go and make disciples of all nations. He wasn't talking about a country. That word there was ethnos in the Bible. If you look at Matthew 28 again, when it says nations, that word in Greek is actually ethnos. And ethnos is uh, ethno-linguistic. It means that it's cultural and language. That's how many different groups we have. So we have 231 countries, but we have 16,000 plus people groups. And so if you open up your uh, manual, why don't you go ahead and turn to that manual again? And I want you to take out the map of the entire world again. And just go ahead and look at the world map. And I just, I want you to see the, the black area again with maybe new eyes. Remember looking at this at day one? It's a little, looks a little different now, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, a little, it's gonna look way different out after outreach when, when you start going there. So that black area, that darkened area, that's where there's usually no Christians, no churches, no missionaries, no evangelism, none of that stuff goes on for the last 2,000 years. That's 40% of the planet. If you notice, some of our friends here are actually from those countries. So, and where we're going, you're going to those countries. <laughs> so um, that's, that's what we're doing. So the idea when you think of missions is... In our generation, we have to understand what are the legacy of our fathers and mothers before us, the leaders before us, what they have been establishing on earth so that we could finish the Great Commission. And so different leaders all around the planet are, um, I mean, you never know when it's going to be done, but at the pace it's going right now, every single people group on the planet will be engaged by 2025. Doesn't mean they're going to be reached. But around that estimate of time, every single people group will at least have an engagement on them now. And then around that same period of time, we're going to be living in the first generation that will have the Bible in every single people group, at least the translation finished. And that means right now there's around, out of 7,000 languages, there's around 4,000 languages, three to 4,000 languages that don't have the Bible yet. So that's, again, like half of, of the Bible. Half of the world, world's languages don't have the Bible. And so when we think about missions, you want to understand this is what we're doing. Even in the Philippines, we're not reaching these cities just to reach these cities. One of the reasons why we're in the Philippines is because of the vast army they have all around the world. That's one of the key, key factors there. This is one of the only open countries in Asia. If you look at that map, go ahead, look at that map again. Look how nice and green the Philippines is, right? Nice and green, right? That's why we can work in all of the places and I can, we can do whatever we want in the spheres with Jesus and all that because, I mean, with a, little bit of, with a little bit of a filter, but it's way open more than Vietnam or even where you're from, right? And every other else besides Southeast Asia. We're the only place, well, not even just Southeast Asia, all of Asia is all darkened. And so that's one of the reasons why we're positioned here is so that we can see a movement, not just the Filipinos, but of leaders and people of our generation sent out through professions and as full-time missionaries into these regions. That's the end goal of it. And so I'm believing that in the Philippines will be one of the largest armies history has ever seen in the Great Commission, mainly because of the fact that, what is it, I think um, it's more than half of these countries, or if it's not even higher, it might be 70%, you can't have an American missionary in. You can't have them, they won't get, they won't get in, right? Even when we talked about the two countries we're going to, some of the foreigners couldn't go into the other country because it was gonna be a little bit too dangerous. And so that's the reason why. But Filipinos, I mean, you guys get in anything. If you guys are brown or like Asian looking, you're pretty good. Maybe not, yeah. <laughs> but like, they'll love you there anyways. Yeah, they'll love you. As long as you don't look like Taylor. But, but Taylor was there. So like, anyway, Taylor weren't there anyways. So it um, doesn't mean that you're closed off from it. But there's, a, there's something happening in Asia where he's raising up an army to finish out this mission too. And so that doesn't exclude 
other people, but it does mean every people group has a significant call on them. And all of us, we're like parts of a song, right? I've been working on music a lot. We're like parts of a song. If some of us are a guitar, some of us are like a harmony, some of us are like a lead vocal. And as we all play our role, then the whole orchestration is finished. And so some of us, our role isn't to be some of these people that go into 1040. Uh, for other people, it might be, right? And some of us here, we might be talking or evangelizing or speaking to people even this week that might be living there. In these, in these areas. And so that's why it's important that we have a very strong understanding of what this is biblically so that we know what we're trying to do strategically. Let's go ahead and define this a little bit more. Go to uh, number one. Actually, I'm going to read to you the overview first. So in this week, what we're going to cover is we're going to go over something called the finish lines. So when we think of the Great Commission, we're not trying to think of it arbitrarily. We're not thinking about it subjectively. We're thinking about it as there is an actual finish line to this Great Commission. Regardless of how Jesus is going to do it, because uh, he's going to work in, I mean, he's been working in miracles all over the place with this, but uh, he's given us commands in the Bible to execute this. And so regardless of how weak we are or whatever, you know, how much we get done of it and all this stuff, Jesus has commanded us to finish this thing out. And so that's what we're going to discuss there, which is the finish lines. We're going to go over that today. The second one is when you look at the entire planet, how do you look at it? You, is sometimes we can look at it like, oh, well, I really like this country. I really like their hot dogs. Or, uh, oh, I like this country. I like their chile or something, right? Or I like this country. I like their pad thai noodle or something. So, but that's one way of looking at it through your like hobbies or something. Another way of looking at it is strategically global. And you could break down the entire world in a way that you could see the patterns, you could see the regions, you could look at the entire earth in a framework that makes sense with finishing the Great Commission through the Bible. And that's essentially what Jesus teaches us inside of the Bible. There's reasons why we didn't teach this the first week. All right, the next one is phases of movements. Everything that was done in the book of Acts and inside of the entire Bible wasn't done by addition and wasn't done by one person and it wasn't done by a single group. It was multi-generational, it was legacy and it was in multiplicative movements. And so everything that we strategize has to be built from this soil of what the Lord said about movements. And so as we, as we read it, we'll actually see things like Apostle Paul. He reached 20 to 25 million people in 10 years because he thought in movements. Jesus reached, I think, a couple of thousand, if not maybe a few 10,000. But then because he worked in movements, he shook down the most powerful country on the planet, which was Rome. If you look at the, if you study the history of Rome, Christology or Christianity was one of the major factors that destroyed it, which is really crazy because Rome is so powerful. If you, if you, if you go to Rome or you see pictures of Rome, their architects were incredibly ingenious. Their, um, their art was phenomenal. It was out of this world. They had aqueduct sewer systems when no one was even thinking about it. They had geometry and all these math mathematicians and people rising out of that region. The greatest thinkers of the time came from Rome, but also the greatest generals and the greatest killers. And that's the reason why they were able to conquer so much land. But then Jesus thought in movements. And because he thought in movements, he not only brought down Rome, but he's going to bring down all of the darkness in the entire world. And all of it operates through the lens of movement. So we're going to talk about what that actually looks like inside of the Bible. The, last, the second to last one is laws of impact. So there's specific things that when you go home or when we work, like in our campaigns and everything that we do, it's strategized around this framework, these finish lines, this type of movement, and these type of characteristics that define massive impact. 
Because if you see everything that Jesus did, it was absolutely massive. Everything he did was, was extraordinarily massive. Whether it started out small and it became massive later, his mentality is all and everything massive, now building its movements, its exponential, it's explosive. That's the way that Jesus thinks. And that's why even the Romans were completely distraught by anyone trained by Jesus. Because if they, they looked at these guys, like the apostles, and they would get freaked out. Because they were like, hey, these guys that were with Jesus are here now. And they're going to shake up and turn this whole place upside down. We need to kill them. That's how massive Jesus operates. He's not even alive at this point anymore. But the people he trained were shaking up India, were shaking up parts of Egypt, were shaking up Rome. And then a hundred years later, you even see some of these countries collapse because of the things that God was building. But that's how we see the lion and the lamb is that he's a lamb, he's a bridegroom, but he's a lion and he's the greatest general on earth. And if you look at Jesus, even when, he's, when um, the other angels like Michael are, fired, are fighting, are going against Satan's minions and all this, he says, um, let the Lord rebuke you, Satan. And the Lord is the absolute supreme commander of the entire army. And then so as we study what he does, then we operate in that level. Or at least that's what we're supposed to be doing as a, as a global body. Let's take a look at number five. So the last one is where we will be dealing with our way of thinking. And so the last one is finish the mission mentality. There's a specific way you have to carry yourself to operate like this. And so I'm going to go over a little bit of what that looks like so that you are equipped, at least enough to make some damage, um, in order of to what it's going to take to carry it out.